Hey friend, welcome back. So in today's show, let's talk about the illusion of evidence-based medicine. There was recently a great editorial in the British Medical Journal talking about the conflicts of interest when it comes to conducting the randomized clinical trials that go into constructing the set of heuristics with a paradigm that many health professionals, we're talking medical doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians, assistants, you know, they all ostensibly say, hey, we practice evidence-based medicine at our clinic. We follow the data, we follow the science. We rely upon the randomized clinical trials to dictate how we practice medicine at this clinic. Well, there's a small problem that is elucidated in this wonderful article that I will link here, and I think it's something we should be aware of, namely conflicts of interest. Because as this article talks about, the raw data from the randomized clinical trials that the pharmaceutical companies often finance and conduct themselves, they don't often reveal the raw data. And so doctors are saying, hey, this study showed that drug X lowered this biomarker and is, is therefore improving clinical parameters related to heart disease or neurodegenerative disease or whatever the, the condition is. So therefore, as a practitioner, we are following evidence-based medicine when we prescribe this drug or this intervention. Here's the problem, as is illustrated in this article. You have the drug companies. We're just going to put, I'll, I'll just do RX, okay? We have the drug companies. We have big pharma, okay? We have the drug companies are hiring key opinion leaders from academ academia, right? So we'll just put uh, academics here. So we'll just put academics. And this is a bi-directional system because oftentimes PhDs and MDs that are, uh, say, working or, or they're assistant professors or associate professors at teaching hospitals or university, they're often on the board of pharmaceutical companies. You might say, well, that's not that big of a deal, Mike, because we have the FDA, we have regulatory bodies. Well, here's the problem, right? So I'm just gonna put reg here. Guess what? This is a bi-directional system as well. Well, we have the drug companies are paying the regulatory bodies, okay? So can you see just a little bit of a conflict here? You have the regulatory body that's receiving money from the pharmaceutical industry, and then you have academics that are also, you know, as part of the FDA council or uh, board members or advisory committees, that are working in academia that might have, you know, there's, we'll talk about some problems with academia here in a moment, but you can see here where there is, there is, there could be potential. I'm not saying every single drug or every single treatment, or, I'm not in, insinuating any nefarious intent from the regulatory bodies or academia, but you can see here how money can influence the decision making when it comes to regulating what drugs, the recommendations, um, the dosing schedule, and, and all these sort of things for prescription compounds and related compounds. And this is what this article is talking about because there's this illusion that the randomized, the RCT, the randomized clinical trial, showed that drug A is much better than placebo. And so therefore, when we prescribe that, we're following evidence-based medicine at this clinic. And that's what I do as a physician. physician. But as this article talks about, Oftentimes, it is the pharmaceutical companies that are conducting the trials and they don't reveal the raw data to the public, to academia, or oftentimes to the regulatory bodies. So you can see how there could be a conflict of interest because ultimately the drug companies like Apple, like Amazon, like any other major company, they are a for-profit business, okay? So they're in the best interest of the regulatory bodies approving the drug, therefore, they get sales, they get, that increases their bottom line because it takes a lot of investment in R&D and, you know, these uh, phase one and phase two and phase three clinical trials, they're very financially intensive. So you can see how there could be conflicts of interest. So what does this mean? This means that we need to continue to have these open conversations and dialogues and be wary of conflicts of interest. Oftentimes what you'll see in papers and opinion pieces is now, thankfully, uh, various journals, The Lancet, uh, you know, Cell, um, Nature, they'll make the uh, authors list their conflicts of interest. That's a good step in the right direction, but here, my friends, is the challenge. Because there's a sort of bi-directional system where there's pharma influencing academia, what happens is there's sort of this common knowledge when it comes to, say, let's just come up with something like LDL cholesterol. It's now common knowledge in evidence-based medicine that you need to lower your LDL cholesterol by way of a statin because that's associated with, they say, reduced risk of heart disease, stroke, and death from all causes related to cardiovascular disease. So if you're an academic professor 
and you're getting funding from your school and your colleagues believe in that, but you don't, and you start speaking out, guess what, guess what happens to you? You get what's known as canceled, okay? Uh, you guys have seen the cancel culture and how aggressive the cancel culture can be and has been. I'm gonna share with you some, some examples of this in just a moment, but this happens in science. The cancel culture and this tribalism sort of mentality, this binary thinking, uh, you know, if you, if you deviate from what your peers say, you are on the chopping block. And this, is, this has been going on in medicine since the 1800s. We've told the story about Ignaz Semmelweis, who was the Hungarian physician that suggested that OBGYNs and doctors that are helping to assist in child birthing wash their hands. He was ostracized and, and relegated to an asylum. asylum. He, he went insane, essentially, because his peers didn't want to wash their hands before delivering a baby. They thought that was sort of uh, you know, not something that you know, physicians should do. Why should they have to wash their hands? The germ theory of disease had, had up to that point had not been elucidated, okay? So he was ostracized. This happens to a lot of different people, okay, in, in academic circles. I have some examples here. We've already shared with you the story about Carl Hennigan. He is the director for evidence-based medicine, here we go again, at Oxford, okay? Now he happens to be, I, I love his, I like his work, he was censored on Twitter. He was ostracized from his physician and, and other you know, academic colleagues for publishing and being a co-author on the Danish mask study. And this was in 2020, November of 2020, his randomized controlled trial. This was the up to now, to the best of my knowledge, one of the only RCTs comparing mask wearing to not mask wearing. Now, of course, you know, the outcome was, was insignificant. It was non-statistically significant, the number of infections in the mask wearing group compared to the non-mask wearing group. Well, it turned out that the big tech companies, that the media, they didn't like what Carl Hennigan had to say, despite the fact that he is the director of evidence-based medicine at Oxford. Okay, my friends, he's not the president of the local QAnon conspiracy theory club. He is up at the academic echelons, right? He got censored on Twitter, fact check on Twitter, and he got death threats, as did Jonas Ludvigsen. Jonas is a Swedish physician. He wrote several articles in New England Journal of Medicine. This was going back in, I wanna say it was early 2021, it was about a year ago. Uh, and he was saying, hey, let's open up the schools. What are we doing to kids? In, in all of Sweden, there's like 900,000 kids under the age of 17 or something to that effect. Maybe it's 1.3 million, but it, it was in that ballpark. And there was all of 15 intensive care unit uh, visits for COVID-19 in children. Well, he said, what are we doing with closing the schools and making these kids wear a mask and the whole thing? I mean, this, the numbers, there's a huge differential here. I think people are not looking at the data. And he wrote an editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine, which most physicians would say that is a journal that represents evidence-based medicine. Well, it turned out that when he published that editorial, he had death threats. He had threats to lose from academic physicians, his peers, saying, don't talk about this. He, he was at risk for losing funding for, he does research as well. So he quit research altogether, okay? You can look up the story. Uh, his name, again, Jonas, J-O-N-A-S, Lud Vixen from Sweden. And we, we did a whole video on this about a year, year and a half ago when it, when it all started to materialize. So my friends, this tribalism mentality is also going on within academic circles where physicians are, you know, helping to advise drug companies. And if there is any sort of dissent or conflicting opinion or, or evidence to the contrary, those individuals are at risk for losing funding. Now, just think about in your own work position, for example, there's been times when you just, you decide not to speak out, not to speak up because you don't wanna lose your job. Even though you feel like you should say something, you should do something, you're like, ah, it's not worth it. I have kids to feed. I have a mortgage. I have a car payment. I'm not gonna say anything. Okay, people that are in academic uh, and have influence in academic circles feel the same way. So they're like, look, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna suck it up. I'm not gonna speak out. I'm not gonna say anything. Uh, now there are whistleblowers and there are outlets to sort of talk about that. But that, my friends, is the crux of the problem. And I wanna share with you uh, a book that I think, you know, maybe down the road we'll do a little bit more about. I I've, I've learned so much from this. It's called Coddling of the American Mind by Greg Lukanoff and uh, Jonathan Haidt, I believe is his name. They talk about all of the sort of logical fallacies and the tribalistic binary thinking, dichotomous thinking they talk about. 
um, where basically people have created this construct that the world is only black or white or uh, it's either mask or no mask, right? And if you support no mask, you also, that must mean you want people to die. You know, that sort of dichotomous thinking that's really problematic. They talk about that in the book and I'll link it below. I think this should be required reading for all of us going through this time because we are seeing so much, um, so many conflicts within our personal life, within our relationships, uh, within society and this, this dichotomous thinking that ultimately goes back to where some people believe, well, it's evidence-based. You know, all the things are being talked about in the media. You know, the thing, uh, well, that's following the data. And, and people don't realize that some of these regulatory bodies are receiving funding. And so the point is, we all need to think a little bit more critically about these things and have, we should have open dialogue. We should be able to talk about these conflicts of interest and how to resolve them without being labeled a conspiracy theorist and wanting other people to die. And that's what this book really goes into. You know, the Greeks, ancient Greeks would, would have talks and discussions to openly challenge each other's beliefs and biases to grow and learn from that. But unfortunately, we're in a, this situation where academic circles, whether it's the, the sort of the zeitgeist within uh, colleges, are preventing any dissenting opinion. And, and they go on and talk about um, protests that happened at Berkeley, various schools in Vermont. We've seen all these riots and so forth over the past couple of years and how that ultimately stems from bad ideas and this, this dichotomous thinking and this tribalism that is occurring. So friends, um, we're seeing this in medicine. I don't know what the solution is, but this is why I've spoken out so much about COVID over the past couple of years because I, I love research and I love sharing research and I think the future of humanity depends upon open conversations about science and uncovering new mechanisms and looking at new biologic targets to get healthier and, and all that. And we're seeing this be eroded partly through finances and partly through tribalistic mentalities occurring in academic circles. And that's not good. That's worrisome. I've seen a lot of people become censored. I've been censored on social media. I had to have fact checkers. Um, the most recent one was when I said, hey, Omicron is much less virulent than other variants because of these different mechanisms, because it's been shown to replicate higher in the upper airway as opposed to the lower airway. And the whole fact checkers wrote this thing, this you know, nutritionist, Mike Mutzel says this, but I'll share it. I mean, it was crazy. And it turned out to be, to be true, right? They don't come back and apologize, of course. And the, the other thing that the Rochelle Walensky, the director of the CDC, I shared a clip of her where she was at Washington University School of Medicine, gave a grand rounds. And then of course, that somehow got spun by fact checkers and said, hey, this nutritionist shared this clip. It was out of context, but it was literally everything that she said uh, right there, which was somehow that was deemed out of context. So again, you have this tribalistic thinking that comes from sort of the, the culture within the safetyism victimology culture that's permeated now through academics. Uh, and so you can't talk about these things and that's, that's worrisome for me. So that's why I make these videos. As always, my friends, hopefully you found this a little bit helpful. I'll put links below to the book, The Coddling of the American Mind. If you've read it, let me know what you think in the comments. If you haven't yet read it, please click the link in the description below. I think you'll dig it. And share this article with a friend. The illusion of evidence-based medicine is something we should be aware of and at least know about the conflicts of interest. And certainly last but not least, check out the docu-series uh, Dope Sick. Phenomenal. It's all about the opioid crisis. It will help you understand this sort of connection here between the regulatory bodies and big pharma and something we should be aware of. And again, just to have conversations with friends to better understand um, how to think more critically about some of the messaging that we hear. As always, thanks for watching. Have a great day. Thanks for that like button. We'll catch you in a future one down the road. Bye now.